Well, yeah, but but the county screwed up. I mean, and um, I want to be respectful of everyone's time that's joining us today. So, welcome. Thank you for meeting with us. Um, we have some exciting updates to provide, and um, we look forward to getting your feedback. And so I think we can jump right in. Um, I don't know if we want to do brief introductions, but perhaps that's a good way to start because it's a little bit awkward to be meeting this way. Um, I'm Hillary Greenberg, the health and conservation agent for the town of Wellfleet. And Scott, I'll go to you because you're top Scott, on the square. Scott Horsley, working as a consultant to the town of Wellfleet, developing a targeted watershed management plan. Fred Felix, chair of the Wastewater Committee. Fred's not unmuted, but another Fred. member of our committee. <laughs> Advantage made member of the Wastewater Committee. Uh, Barbara Kickham, I'm with MassDEP and I'm the TMDL section chief. I'm located in the Worcester office. Brian Dudley, MassDEP, Southeast. Hi, everybody. Millie Garcia Serrano, Regional Director in the Southeast Regional Office of Mass DEP. Good afternoon. Hi. Drew O'Shea, Mass DEP. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, I'm just going to Drew O'Shea, Mass DEP, uh, Southeast Region. I'm Kellogg with Mass DEP in the Bureau of Water Resources, and I've been working with uh, both Brian Kickham, I mean, Brian Dolly and Barb Kickham <laughs> on the Wellfleet TMDL and also the Herring River Restoration Project. All right, uh, this is Brian Doyle, I'm EPA Region 1 uh, in the Nonpoint Shed, uh, Nonpoint Source Watershed Unit. And I'm Anastasia Videnko. I'm an engineer with GHD working on the hydraulic load testing for the transfer station site in Wellfleet. I'm Jeff Gregg from GHD, a senior project manager there, and I'm working with Anastasia on that project. All right, I'm Tim Pastacarnas with the Cape Cod Commission. I'm a water resource analyst there, and we've been assisting the town and Scott with uh, various aspects of development of the targeted watershed management plan. Great, and I think that's all of us. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Scott um, to kick us off here. Okay, let me find my slideshow. Had it all set to go here. There we go. How about that one? Okay. Let me get that on. Hey, um, Scott, this is Millie. Before you get going, um, yes, I Millie. Think the call in user is Drew Osei. Is that correct, Drew? Yeah, I introduced myself. Yeah, <laughs> that's me. Yeah, if you don't mind just introducing yourself to the team, Drew. Uh, Drew Ose, Southeast Region Office, uh, Mass DEP. Great, thank you. Hey, Drew. Okay, well, I'll get started and I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, Tim is going to uh, assist me in the middle here. He, as he indicated, the commission is assisting in developing this plan. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to go quickly because <laughs> I think most people here know a lot of this, so I don't want to repeat too much. Um, and I'm going to defer to Jeff and his team on the transfer station, but as I think everybody knows that study is underway, uh, looking at the transfer station site as a um, as an option for a centralized solution. So we'll be looking. Uh, I won't say any more about that. We provided some background information to Jeff and his team when they got going. We've been coordinating a little bit. I know they've been in the field doing some testing, and and again, I'll let him uh, address that. So um, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but I just wanna show you that we do, we have prepared a plan on how to get to the magic numbers uh, using non-traditional approaches as an alternative to centralized sewer. We are using the build out loads as opposed to the existing loads, which makes our job a little bit harder. But you can see across the top here, we've got each one of the sub embayments 
and the so-called build-out loads, the threshold and, and the amount required to get there, and then a line here showing what percent reduction. All these numbers come directly from the MEP report. And then down here in the bottom, we've identified, was it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine strategies that we are currently evaluating. We've had uh, a number of meetings with the Wastewater Committee and Board of Health and the Housing Committee, et cetera. And I'll just summarize here and say that uh, at, this, at the current time, we're really looking seriously at some of these so-called enhanced INA systems as a measure. Uh, aquaculture is still part of the program, as is stormwater and fertilizers. I mentioned the Mayo Creek restoration project here, but we're also looking at Herring Creek watershed as a tool to help us get there. And then we've got some uh, PRBs we're thinking about, um, fertigation wells, the golf course, and then this housing project that we want to spend a little bit on a time today called 95 Lawrence, and we'll come back to that. Um, the most challenging part of the project, as is true in most estuaries, is sort of the headwaters here. Uh, Duck Creek, the so-called cove area. This is a picture from the Commission's uh, Watershed MVP tool, which we're using to help plan this out. Uh, and I, these are four of the items that I just mentioned that I want, we want to focus on just briefly today in terms of uh, critical projects that we think might help us get at least part way to the, to the goals. So I'm going to start with uh, 95 Lawrence, and I don't, I'm not sure if everybody is aware of this, but, uh, but I'll just give it a two minute introduction, then I'll let um, Hillary, Kurt, and others from the town, if they want to expand on it, but there's, a, there's an affordable housing project planned uh, on 95 Lawrence Road, which is just uh, northeast of, this is Route 6 right here, just for orientation, and this is the, uh, I believe this is the road that heads down a commercial street towards the town center. Um, we've got the police and fire station, the elementary school up front here. And Cape Cod Commission has given a grant to the town, which I'll let Tim talk about in a minute, uh, to look at wastewater alternatives here. So given the orientation of this project, uh, which is outlined in this parcel here, to these other municipal service, again, fire, police, and elementary, as well as a number of Title V projects, uh, Title V uh, properties up here to the north and northeast. Um, we thought it might be worth looking at some, uh, some neighborhood scale cluster systems uh, as, as an alternative to simply building a system for the housing project. I should mention this is in the Duck Creek watershed, which is our most challenged watershed, so it really provides a nice uh, opportunity. So at this point, I think I'm going to just, I'll flip your slides for you, Tim, and let Tim take over here. Tim and I have been talking quite a bit about this project, and I, I'll just go back and say one other thing. Uh, Bowler Engineering did provide a report uh, looking at a number of different potential technologies for this site, and Tim and I and others have been looking at this, assessing it sort of from a nitrogen reduction standpoint and a cost effectiveness standpoint. So I really will stop there, Tim, and let you take it from here. Go ahead. Sure. Thanks, Scott. And I think that's a that's a very good way of characterizing this kind of brief analysis that I've done is that the all of the costs and sort of performance data that uh, that went into these calculations came from that draft report that Bowler has issued. And so certainly any any sort of questions about the technical details are, are probably answered in there. But this this is mainly to provide a little more context to to their report and uh, just how these different scenarios might fit into the town's overall plan for Wellfleet Harbor. So just anticipating questions that might come up. So I am going to show some uh, comparisons to a title, a, a comparable Title V system. Uh, those, any numbers that are associated with that are based on this MEP 26 and a quarter milligrams per liter effluent. So any, any Title V numbers I show, that's where they, that's what they're based on. Uh, we use the Amphidrome system for cost comparison purposes. I think it ended up as the lowest cost alternative in each of the three scenarios, but also just, you know, so that we can kind of look at the three scales and keep the, the moving parts in the comparison to a minimum. So we're not, not necessarily making any sort of endorsement of one system or another, but this is for what we used for this illustration. 
Uh, all estimates are based on design flows, so actual flows will obviously be uh, somewhat lower, but for our purposes, that's, that's how we calculated things. And then just one, one thing that's kind of a little bit of a subtlety, but all these costs that are being presented are the, the actual costs so, or as uh, estimated in the report. So it's not sort of the cost above a installing a comparable Title V system. So hopefully that doesn't confuse things more, but we, we get into some kind of funny lingo when we're talking about how the nitrogen nitrogen discharges compared to Title V, but then costs are sort of on their own. So just get that out there. Hopefully that doesn't confuse things and we can we can move on to the next slide. And it looks like looks like my titles somehow must be white text on white background. So I will I will narrate them. But this is basically the the first what I'm calling scenario one, uh, which is just treating the wastewater from the affordable housing development using an IA septic system, basically. Uh, so this is a system designed just under 10,000 gallons of design flow. And for each one of these scenarios, we've sort of presented a high and a low estimate of what the, so a high, uh, higher nitrogen effluent level. So in this scenario, the high estimate is 25, the low is 19. So in each of these cases, the 25 is based on what was specified in the engineering report as kind of the minimum performance requirement for the technologies evaluated. Uh, the 19 is a typical effluent nitrogen level that IA systems would be permitted for through mass CEP. So that's kind of just to illustrate uh, the, the extents of the range that might be expected for each of these systems. Uh, and so basically with this first system, we are treating a new source of nitrogen to the watershed. So it has, uh, you know, it has a capital cost of around $600,000 and then annual operations around $20,000 a year, basically a 30 year cost of around $1.2 million. And because all three scenarios that we envision are similar cost structures, so they're a large capital cost up front with smaller ongoing maintenance costs. Uh, these, are, these are just sort of simple, simple total costs and then the total is just, or the annual cost is the total divided by 30 years. So no, no discount rates or anything like that because the cost structures are the same. And, and when, when I did do this analysis and came up with an equivalent annual cost, it didn't, it didn't, change, didn't change any of the, the sort of comparison between the three. All right, so that's all, that's all stuff that's laid out in the report. Uh, let's talk about the nitrogen impact. So this first scenario, which is using an IA system to treat uh, the wastewater from the affordable housing development would remove somewhere between 20 and 100 kilograms of nitrogen per year. That's compared to if it were just discharging to a Title V, but it's still going to add nitrogen to the Duck Creek subwatershed because it's a new source of nitrogen from new development. And so the cost implications of this are, you know, you'll see in a lot of the 208 plan technologies matrix, there's sort of a, a basis for comparison among different technologies is what's the cost per kilogram nitrogen removed. And so for each of these, I'll present the cost per, kil per kilogram nitrogen removed uh, compared to a comparable Title V system. So that's sort of the, I don't know the best way to describe it, but basically, basically the cost of that enhanced treatment. But independent of that, you can also have a separate cost, which is the cost per kilogram of nitrogen removed from the watershed. And so what that takes into account is that you have to you have to remove all of that new nitrogen that the new development has created and then anything beyond that counts as a reduction to the watershed. So for scenario one, the 
cost per kilogram nitrogen compared to Title V is it ranges between $400 and $2,000, but you can't calculate a cost per kilogram nitrogen uh, reduction from Duck Creek because it's not reducing the nitrogen load to Duck Creek. It's actually adding to it. So hopefully just that isn't too just confusing, one. but yes, if there's yeah. questions. Yeah, just a really quick one. Um, the effluent, what is the amphidrome actually, what's the uh, estimate for what the amphidrome system in particular uh, will have for effluent? Because I know you're, the 25 and the 19 are based on um, uh, matrix numbers, but what's the actual system no, target? No, so the, the, 20, the 25 is what's in the Bowler report. So that was what they specified the, the system needed to be able to meet. Right, but what is it? I think it was different. My recollection was it was, it was a bit lower, the actual system. The specification was that, but that it would perform better than that? Or maybe I have it wrong. Scott, you? I think that's the 19 number. Is that right, Tim? Closer to actual performance, maybe? Yeah, I mean, my, my assumption was the 19 is what the, the general use permits typically or seem to most frequently be at, although if, if anyone from DEP knows, knows better, but that seems to be at least what I associate with IA, nitrogen reducing IA systems. It depends upon what the flow is. Generally, for the most part, the 19 is assigned to systems less than 2,000. Gotcha. Um, 25 would be assigned to systems between two and 10,000. As a general rule of thumb, it's not true for every single system. But um, that also is following along the sampling and operation and maintenance schedule described in the Title V approvals. So, which is considerably less stringent than if you were under um, a groundwater discharge permit where you would have more more professional and frequent management of the system, in which case you probably could get numbers significantly lower than the 19. But you'd have to anyways, Brian, right? Because you'd have to hit 10 at a minimum at that point um, as soon as you go over yeah, 10. Under a, under a groundwater discharge permit. Yeah. But, say if, but say if you were doing it 9,900 and it was under Title V, but you had management similar to a groundwater discharge permit, you'd probably get less than 19. Great, Th I just wanted to clarify that. That's great, thank you, Brian. All right, so on to the next scenario. And so this envisions uh, having a, we'll call it a centralized treatment system that's now going to incorporate not only the affordable housing development, but also several of the municipal properties that Scott pointed out on the the figure earlier, so the, the police station, the elementary school, and basically collect, you know, collect a bunch of flow from nearby, nearby town-owned properties. Uh, it is much higher design flow. It also has a much lower effluent nitrogen, so a greater level of nitrogen uh, removal. And Again, I mean, I'm not, I won't read through all the costs, but basically if we look at the nitrogen impacts here, here's where we actually get into some pretty significant reductions, certainly compared to a Title V system, but now by adding these additional properties and starting to remove some nitrogen that was already, uh, you know, already being discharged prior to the you know, the impending development of the affordable housing project, we start to see some reductions on the, the order of 200 to, you know, maybe 350 kilograms of nitrogen per year from the watershed. Uh, and the cost per kilogram of nitrogen, you know, drop pretty significantly here. And I think it is this, this scenario certainly represents the ability to take advantage of some uh, 
you know, economy of scale and also enhanced treatment efficiency that comes with a larger scale treatment system with relatively minor investments in collection system being required because it is several fairly high flow properties that are quite close to where the proposed treatment system would be. So you end up with, uh, you know, cost per kilogram nitrogen much lower uh, compared to Title V, and now you're actually starting to get into uh, get into removing nitrogen from the watershed. So we can jump ahead to the next slide, which is scenario three, and this expands upon scenario two, but also includes a collection system to, uh, to reach out to some of the neighboring residential properties so we've gone from 25,000 to 35,000 gallons per day of design flow, basically the same, same expected uh, level of treatment as one might expect the, uh, you know, both the, the capital cost has gone up to accommodate that additional design flow. The O&M costs have gone up slightly. Uh, and Again, as you add more existing properties to the treatment system, you're now seeing even uh, higher levels of nitrogen removal from the watershed. And what we see here then, if we look at the, the cost per kilogram, is it actually goes up a little bit when compared to Title V. Uh, when we compare it to that previous scenario, and it's because we're starting to add in some of those collection system costs and it drives the cost per kilogram up a bit. Uh, and that shows up both in the, uh, I believe in the title, in the Title V comparison and in the watershed removal as well. But we can go to the next slide and kind of look at things, kind of look at them all together to see that basically, so as, as you increase in the design flow and sort of the reach of the collection system, the, the potential cost per kilogram uh, removal from the watershed just goes down with scale. And you know, that, that's typically what you might expect as you, you know, as you get to these larger, larger scale systems, the cost goes down as long as it isn't offset by the size or uh, by the cost of the associated collection system, but you can in the comparison with Title V see that that does that does start to show up uh, the increased cost from collection between scenario two and scenario three. But I mean, I think the really important take home from this is, as Scott mentioned, this is one of the going to be one of the most challenging sub watersheds to remove nitrogen from. And either of the centralized scenarios have you know, have the potential to take care of somewhere on the order of 15 to 30 percent of that overall reduction needed, uh, you know, versus the first scenario, which is only treating the, uh, the wastewater from the affordable housing development, which results in adding nitrogen to the watershed, which then at a later date would have to be uh, offset by some other reduction technology. So I think it's, it's fantastic that these options are being evaluated at this early planning stage so that decisions can be made kind of thinking about that, that future watershed wide context. Tim, I can't help but note this last cost here, 208. I wonder if there's any significance to that. Uh, there's there's got to be just a complete happy accident. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't couldn't help myself there. Okay, well, thank thank you, uh, Tim. And maybe we'll just keep going here and hold questions unless anybody's got any burning ones. I got another seven or eight slides here. Just want to make sure we did try and send out the report. I know I tried to send the report to the folks at MassDEP and it bounced back from each and every one of you. So I tried to share the link that Scott had put together. So I just want to make sure folks received a copy of the report so they can peruse that. Ryan, I think I sent you a copy. Did you get it? Yeah, I did. I re yeah, so I've, I've, I've already reviewed it. Um, okay. You know, the only Good. The only thing that I would say is that with the, um, you know, with most of the um, 
treatment alternatives identified, you know, for either scenario two or three um, with proper operation, uh, you probably could get on, on an annual average even below six. Yeah. Um, which provides even, even more benefit. The other thing I'll note is of the total capital cost of, of scenario three, which was in, I think a little over $4 million, more than half of it, I think the number is 2.4 million is the collection system. So uh, just an interesting thought to stash away. And I think we all know this, that um, many places of the Cape, that seems to be the a significant driver in some of these costs. And I think Tim, you and I have talked that may be why some of these costs per unit costs actually go up in alternative three versus alternative two, but we can come back to that. Have you guys identified a, um, a um, area to, for this, for the system? So you go to scenario three, do we have the, the space to put it in? There are, uh, Bowler did do a series of, I'd call conceptual level site plans uh, looking at where these facilities might go on the property and I think it's a it was a six acre site so I think it's fair to say there probably is room for everything um, but the, uh, that would need to be sort of uh, you know ground truth with a more detailed engineering plan but they did in their report they do provide at least a conceptual picture and I think they probably sized it correctly to, per facility so it looks like it'll work, Fred, but you're right. It, this, this is a question that would need to be evaluated in a more detailed plan, for sure. Thanks. Yep. So let me move on. The other site in this watershed, and it actually spills over to the uh, other challenged watershed, the Cove down here, is a possible PRV installation here along Commercial Street. It's kind of, it looks pretty, uh, prob pretty promising in that it is down gradient from some pretty high density areas. So we've been evaluating that. And uh, this is the location of the intersection between Bank Street and Commercial, where there is a uh, town owned parking lot. Um, and it might be an opportunity, we've been talking as part of the wastewater committee for a pilot project to put in some uh, multi-level wells and start evaluating the possibility of a uh, PRB installation that might start here and then and then possibly expand both um, both directions along Commercial Street. And I just want to mention briefly that I was invited to and attended this past week a very good webinar by EPA ORD. Brian, I'm not sure you're familiar with it, but Marcel actually invited me. And there's a group of people down in Long Island who have built a PRB in a uh, very near shore area. You can see it right here along the shoreline. The reason I was interested in this is, as you, as you can note from this uh, picture, to do this, we're pretty close to some tidal waters. So the, the issue of saltwater intrusion or the salt groundwater is a factor. So I was interested in this presentation, which I attended. And uh, here are just some pictures. Of, so they're calling these things bulkhead PRBs right along the shoreline. This is a plan view picture and actually a photograph of the installation and then the final product. And they are finding that they're getting uh, really good removal rates and within this zone where they are getting some salinity in the groundwater. So I just present this as, a, um, as an interesting pilot project that might help us if we do decide to go down this road, um, come up with some kind of a conceptual design to at least test this as a pilot. But it does look like a, um, a good potential location. So that's one of the things that we've got in our plan at this point, we're vetting this further. and. Uh, I intend to talk further with these people in Long Island about some details and uh, I think the town might be interested in conducting at least a preliminary investigation of uh, multi-level wells and, and nitrogen along that area in groundwater to determine the potential for that PRB. Uh, the other technology, which is probably, you know, the one that we're really uh, looking at in a lot of detail is are these so-called enhanced INAs. Now I admit I am showing one technology here, the, mitro, the nitro system, John Smith's technology. There are others, notably the Nitrex system. And I think the work that George Hoyfeld has been doing that probably also um, fit into this category of what we're calling advanced or enhanced INA systems as a potential. 
And I've been working with uh, Hillary, who's provided me some interesting data on how many systems get repaired, upgraded, et cetera. And one of our thoughts here is trying to do this on an opportunistic basis, meaning when you're digging up a site for some other reason, uh, that might be a time to go in and cost effectively bring in one of these technologies. Because when you start looking at the costs, which we've been doing in some detail, a lot of them have to do with excavation, landscaping, uh, separate from the actual cost of the technology. So we're thinking that if we can tie this program to other improvements along the way, it could be pretty cost effective. And, and if you just look at Hillary's numbers for the last three years and then project this out over a 30 year period, um, and, and assuming we get a 75% reduction rate, which is a number we're using in our planning process right now, um, that could generate um, a reduction of about 7,000 kilograms per year over that 30 year period towards the goal of the 20,000 kilograms per year. And I should mention these are town wide numbers. The 20,000 is a town wide, or I should say a watershed wide number. So we're just trying to look at these, these uh, figures just as a, as a general comparison to see instead of people knocking on people's doors and saying, you've got to put in a system now, if we, if we tie it to a program where they're already doing work, uh, perhaps we can get this implemented at a more uh, cost-effective manner. Similarly, we also looked at real estate transfers as a possible mechanism. And if we look at the numbers from Wellfleet over, a, again, a projected 30-year period, we might get as many as close to 2,000 systems in and, and a reduction of about 10,000 kilograms. So just, just some numbers to think about how this might get implemented. Uh, and then finally, we've been talking with the Board of Health. We've had one meeting, very good meeting, uh, at the possibility of, of drafting and implementing a regulation somewhat similar to other communities. I think, was it Mattapoiset or Marion that just implemented a regulation like this? Um, and this nomenclature is per the Wellfleet regulations. But just very briefly, the way the regu this regulation might work is that uh, any, any repairs or new systems that go in would have to, at a minimum, install a uh, DP uh, approved nitrogen INA system. And the first, first paragraph we're talking about all of them that meet this 19 milligram level. And then in the next paragraph, we talk about the possibility of the town providing some sort of a financial incentive to upgrade that with the homeowner to go from a, what I'd call a, a base level INA up to these enhanced INAs. And as you can see in the, in the draft regulation, we're actually calling out some possible pre-approved technologies. And we indicate that others can certainly apply for approval, but the goal would be to get systems that have proven third party uh, testing that gets down below 10. And then the third paragraph here, we actually added after the first Board of Health hearing because people were asking a question, what happens if people start putting this, these in and then later on the area, part of the area gets sewered. So this language is directly from the town of Chatham where they were considering something similarly. Um, uh, Hillary and I have already talked about this and, and these not, this may not be the actual language that the Board of Health considers, but I wanted to put something in here as a placeholder. The idea would be to provide some relief the property owners that made this kind of investment. And then, um, you know, as I said, if, if the town decides to go forward with a centralized sewer at some point, we'd give that, those property owners some relief. So that is, um, that's the regulation that's in front of the Board of Health. We, as I said, we've had one meeting, uh, we're meeting again, I think in October um, to, to discuss this further. And then related to that, of course, um, Brian and I and Tim and others are serving on this committee with DEP to look at regulatory changes in Title V that might be coincident to some degree with what we're talking about here. Although we've only had one meeting of that advisory committee, but as I think everybody knows, there's some language in Title V that might provide some direction on this on a state level basis. So that's something that we're considering and also trying to be consistent with. So I just, I'm not gonna get into any details here, but just call that out as something that is ongoing that we wanna be cognizant of and be um, consistent with. And then the, the next to the last thing I wanna mention is as I think most people are aware, the town has been looking at a couple of major restoration projects, one being Mayo Creek, the other being uh, Herring River. 
And we've been looking at this project in some detail and talking to the people at Woods Hole Group who actually did, uh, oops, sorry, some of the studies uh, on this project. And we believe this does feed into uh, the inner harbor area the, so the, which, where we need some benefits. So we think there will be some benefits. We've been trying to provide some estimates of what we might get there to a conversion of fresh marsh to salt marsh. And that is, um, that's ongoing. And the last item I just want to hit is, and I'm, I'm not sure Nancy has joined us here or not, and working with Nancy Sabetta, the town shellfish constable, regarding the shellfish aquaculture program. Um, there is some data that suggests the oyster landings, which are shown here on the right, are increasing. Uh, the clam landings have been going down. Uh, we've been trying to translate this to nitrogen levels. On the left, we have a, a picture of some of the shellfish aquaculture grants that have been made in the in the harbor area. So the intent here is um, to work with the shellfish department and develop a plan, a 20 to 30 year plan to look at what sort of uh, uh, enhancements might occur there and what sort of credits we might be able to at least consider as part of the um, targeted watershed plan. So that's pretty much it. Um, that's where we're at. Um, thanks for listening. And, uh, you know, see, these are some of the next steps that we've outlined here. I've already touched on all of these, so I won't go over them again. But uh, maybe I'll stop there, stop sharing my screen so we can see people again. And uh, so maybe I'll ask first if Kurt or Hillary want to add anything to what I've said. No, I think the the only thing that I would add is um, I did, just as a sidebar, um, I did talk with the um, uh, the assistant town administrator kind of to talk about some financing mechanisms and uh, just to, to talk about for example the enhanced IA you know at a level of uh, 60 systems a year and that didn't include the real estate transfers but I think real estate transfers plus um, new builds uh, gets us to close to 50 percent or something like that for our you know uh, overall um, reduction requirement uh, which is pretty, to me, that's just amazing. But the other thing is that the, we're currently bringing in about 600,000 or 500 or 600,000 in the, the town's portion of the Airbnb tax. And that just about, that's just about exactly what would be required uh, for the incentive, the town incentive for those systems. So, you know, in terms of matching that up, that looks pretty promising. Um, and anyway, I just, we're, we're working on some of those those things including you know usda financing uh the county's working on some some elements of financing but i think the other major piece that would have to be part of our watershed plan obviously is where's the money going to come from for for uh for this effort and so i, I did want to say that we are making some progress on that there and i think there's some things that line up nicely with what scott's got for technical uh proposals here. And obviously, if, you know, Millie, I've reached out to you before and or um, EPA, if there are funds that, that could be available for some of the elements of this, because they're, in, you know, innovative and alternative, uh, we'd like to try to start to include those either by, by virtue of making applications, um, you know, and or, uh, you know, working with the, the either grantors or the agencies to try to line those things up with some of these elements. Absolutely, I'm glad we're having this conversation and um, I have a little bit more clarity as it pertains to some of the scenarios that you're running. And um, you know, we'll definitely confer with EPA in our senior leadership in Boston to see uh, what we have in the coffers. But the, you know, the only other two things I would just mention is that again, the, uh, you know, enhanced IAs Townwide through regulation produces an enormous, enormous benefit to the watershed in terms of our overall target. And the other thing was just this 95 Lawrence uh, adding the municipal buildings in a portion of the residential area, you know, getting close to, uh, you know, 20, 25 or 30 percent of the Duck Creek load. Big, these are really big things for us. So we were surprised by the analysis, encouraged, um, and Anyway, that's just sort of, I think, our reaction. Yeah, I guess, uh, I think this is great. We, so we have nine potential strategies. Um, 
I think where I had left off, and I really apologize because I've been a little bit out of the picture for the last couple of months here, um, but kind of back in the fold. Um, surprised that I didn't see any potential backup scenario with regards to any kind of active sewering in the downtown area. I think that was an idea that we spoke about maybe a year ago. Um, so I just, you know, wanted to hear a little bit more about that. And um, my only other comment has to do with um, 95 Lawrence Road housing project. Um, what's the timeline for that project? Hillary, do you <laughs> probably two years. Okay. Yeah, I think we're struggling um, a little bit <clears throat> thinking about putting large scale wastewater treatment there because it's going to be a public private partnership. So we have some legal um, things that we need to work out, make sure the housing authority is on board and that we can sustain something like this and um, actually carry it out and find a developer to develop the site for housing, knowing that we also want to put wastewater on it. So there's, there's several balls up in the air, but um, we think it's a good idea and it's worth us pursuing. So we are trying to move that forward. So time frame, I'd go two years, if not more. And Thank Millie, you. Millie, I'll just respond to your, your point, the question on uh, the centralized sewer. I did show a quick slide, but I didn't want to, at the beginning of my presentation, I didn't want to spend a lot of time because I know Jeff Gregg is going to speak here shortly. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're evaluating the transfer station, which is a site the town had previously identified as a potential disposal area for a central system. Once we know the capacity of that site, and we can look back at, uh, I did show a slide that showed, uh, I think of some potential sewering areas identified by environmental partners, which was a previous consultant working for the town. So that will be, certainly will be identified in the plan. I didn't mean to uh, not spend more time on that, but again, knowing that Jeff was gonna speak to that, I wanted to defer to him. In fact, that may be a good segue here, uh, Hillary, I'm not sure what's next on the agenda. I, I had a quick question. Sure. Um, you said that you were basing all your calculations on build out. So I just yes. wanted to make sure that when you're talking about percentages of target load removal, that's including, that's including build out because if like with the enhanced treatment systems, if you're talking about putting them in for new construction, that's new load that's going in. So correct. Yeah, uh, the number, I think that's correct, Brian. Um, I, off, just out of um, memory, rounding off the numbers, um, the existing load according to MEP reduction was about 10,000 kilograms per year. With the build out, it goes up almost double to about 20,000. Okay. And we're working with that 20,000 number. All right. And, the, and, if, if you, and I, I, I only spent a minute on the spreadsheet, but if you looked at that first line item, that deals with future growth. Yeah. And it makes that assumption that if the town adopts this health regulation we're talking about, that all of that would be reduced by 75% load yeah. going forward. And then, um, and then the other thing too, is that, um, you know, for the systems that you would be offering the $10,000 incentive, um, you know, none of those have general use approval. They're all provisional use. Correct. Um, so that there's an element of risk there. In, in terms of whether or not they're going to be able to get to general to general use. Understood. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's no question about that, Brian. And the other the other thought that we had was uh, you know, in part that if we if we did go forward with something like this, uh, it would it would provide the opportunity to get a, a number of uh, a, a much larger number of systems installed, which could help accelerate um, general approval. Um, obviously, the risk is on us, but and you know until you get a certain number of systems out there and installed, uh, we can't get to general use. So the thought there was to try to help out. Okay. And um, and some of those uh, some of those alternatives with respect to financing, um, some of them either could be financed under the Community Septic Betterment Program or some of them um, may be eligible for more traditional SRF. Now. SRF, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, either or. And we're just starting to look at financing. In fact, I've got a call tomorrow with um, 
Jack Eunice, who's very interested in talking about the Barnstable County role in some of these uh, mm -hmm. programs. Right, and I think the fact that you, um, the town is working towards um, basically memorializing all these efforts by way of a watershed permit, that really bodes well with regards to um, SRF permitting, excuse me, effort, SRF financing, it just gives a little bit more um, stature. I have a question for Barbara. Um, so the um, approvals of the um, INA, the enhanced, um, can you speak to that or is that a different sort of group in Boston? I know you're out of Worcester and I'm just wondering um, who exactly is um, the DEP arm that would look um, to these proposals and basically agree um, that they are a good idea and they get DEP approval. I think Brian can answer that. I don't have anything to do with the IA systems. Um, we're not, we don't do it out in watershed planning. It's a separate group in wastewater. And I think they hired someone a few months ago specifically to kind of move that faster. Yeah, they poached, they poached Southeast for that person. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, right now um, the three well, actually, the layer cakes right now, I believe, are under site-specific piloting approval. Nitro and Nitrex have provisional use approval. Um, and as Kurt said, you know, we need a certain number of them in. Um, with Nitro, uh, they just got their provisional use approval, and they have an agreement with the Barnstable Clean Water Coalition in hopes that they will be able to install several systems within a, a pond community that would get them up to if, or, or close to uh, the 50 systems that need to be tested over the next three years to gain general use approval if they operate as, as promised. So, um, and once we reach that 50, that would be the limit. So, um, so if the 50 is taken up, you know, it, it, as part of this program, um, it may be, it may not be possible to, to get, you know, additional ones elsewhere. Um, but, um, you know, we just have to wait, we have to wait for those installations to come in. We have to get the data and we have to analyze the data um, before we can make a final decision on that. Yeah, Brian, I was speaking with uh, John Smith this morning. He, he claimed he's got 18 systems currently installed, and I believe those were all being monitored. You probably know better than I. Um, and as you said, um, the Barnstable Clean Water Coalition project will probably be installing another couple of dozen, would be my guess, from mm -hmm. recent conversations. So we're, we're getting there, and I guess um, maybe – one, th one question would be in that we hope to submit this targeted watershed plan, certainly within the year, we need to get a, you know, the work done from GHD and incorporate the centralized alternative or backup plan or, or that portion of it. But can you envision a uh, proving a targeted watershed plan that would include a technology like these enhanced INAs with the centralized sewer backup as a, as a uh, well, backup, use that term again, in case the general approval doesn't, doesn't occur. Yeah, I think the thing is, is that, you know, the expectations of a targeted watershed management plan is that you're going to be providing it in a, in a phased manner. Yes. So yeah. that you know, the timing of your different alternatives would play into that kind of schedule. Yep. Um, now, say, if you did want to do this and, and rely on enhanced IA systems in your first phase, then, you know, it, the, the backup plan is certainly more critical, I think, than if you would want to do it in, you know, phase three or four, you know. Um, so, I mean, we can just, you know, we can discuss 
you know, th those kinds of details as you're developing the plan, but um, it's, it's certainly a plausible suggestion. Okay, good, and thank you. Just one other observation there too, Brian. I think um, the, the, the objective here would be to have a lot of eggs in the basket. So that's, you know, that's why we're talking about a demonstration potentially with uh, the permeable reactive barrier, the Mayo Creek restoration, um, you know, some of the, um, the oyster activity. Uh, so having a variety of technologies in play, the 95 Lawrence. So we've got a, we've got a diversification of, you know, where our eggs are so that certainly, you know, what falls out or doesn't work, um, you know, we're not just simply depending on one or two. Mm -hmm. Hey, Kurt, I do have a question on that PRB. Um, how much money are you looking for for that particular technology, the test drive pilot? Scott would have a better idea of cost. We did get some data on what the well cost would look like. Initially, what we thought is just as, you know, as uh, Scott had mentioned, you know, a, a demonstration pro project to figure out what we've got in the groundwater for nitrogen to see what assist, you know, what a larger scale uh, installation could potentially remove from that area. Um, we focused on it, as Scott mentioned, because it's one of the denser areas and there's probably a lot of nitrogen in the groundwater. Um, so we think that's one of the best places to focus. But do you have a do you have a rough? I'm trying to give you some time to think there, Scott, for what you think the possible. Nice, <laughs> appreciate that. <laughs> well, we do. We did get a quote for some uh, installation. I think of nine multi-level wells, which is going to be critical here to really design the thing. I think that was on the order of around thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. And then um, you know there would be some engineering design installation. I'm. I mean, don't hold me to this, but I'm guessing we're in the one to $200,000 range to install a, a small scale pilot. We do have a good site there and then it's town owned. Um, and it looks like I have, I've looked at the infrastructure. Uh, I should mention uh, NRCS did install a stormwater infiltration system there just a couple of years ago as part of a water resources project. So we'd be kind of working around that. But I think um, something in that range, Millie, and, and, and I can certainly try to pull together some more, uh, make that a little bit tighter. Yeah, um, I really want to see if I can follow this up. Um, this is again, maybe, I don't know, definitely pre-COVID. Um, there was a there was an incoming question to our region that came in. I want to say, do you remember this, Brian, from uh, the Department of um, Revenue or the Treasurer's Office? But they were looking um, specifically on just if you had a project that dealt with PRB, do you have a site on the Cape? And at the time, I know that there were some things that were cooking with EPA doing PRBs and so on and so forth, but we didn't really have a candidate site. And now that um, this is, you know, you're talking about this, maybe um, I would have to go back and kind of see what my email and um, the request was and if it's something that's still um, available for, you know, exploring. So um, I'd like to see if I can catch up on this um, this week and kind of see if I can get this email. Um, and then just basically say, hey, during the course of our discussion, follow up with the town of Wellfleet, um, this is one of the nine things that they're looking to advance um, the conversation around um, nitrogen reduction. Millie, that would be great. Uh, I mentioned I'm working with uh, Marcel Beliveau, who's for EPA, Brian knows as well, uh, on a project in Barnstable where we're actually beginning construction of a pilot, different kind of a PRB as part of a cranberry bog restoration project. But um, um, we'd love, we'd very, be very interested in pursuing that with EPA, either as fun, either with funding and or technical assistance, because I know Marcel has been a tremendous source for us on other projects on Cape Cod. Okay, great. Um, I'll definitely regroup with Brian again and, and Drew will say on this one. Thank you. Fantastic, thanks. So you're saying 30K for the initial, just- The drilling. The drilling. Yeah, and then we'd have uh, sampling and site characterization, and then there would have to be some engineering design and obviously construction, and then and then more monitoring. So um, I'm again just guessing, and we can we could we can size the project to fit a budget, but it would probably a threshold level would be in the hundred to two hundred thousand dollar range, I would think. Okay. If it helps provide any context of uh, who he has a SNEP grant for a PRB demonstration down in Falmouth and that was 250,000 for 
I want to say 120 foot long PRV with all the associated monitoring mm -hmm. wells and uh, kind of engineering design for the carbon source and all those yeah. all those sorts of things. So it's just another data point for, and that was just in that was installed several months ago. So current dollars. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. You guys, I'm going to have to jump to another meeting, but I, I, I truly appreciate all of you being on, on this call and, 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 and entertaining me for the last hour. It definitely, we keep on kicking this ball down the road, and I think we have a, a big plan, um, and we have, some good, we have some good outcomes identified, um, and, um, and I definitely the, the, the town is committed. So anyway, uh, I'll let you guys carry on without me. Take care. Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Fred. Okay, so moving on in the interest of time, it's about two o'clock. We have one more hour and we have GHD next up on the list. So Jeff or Anastasia, which, which one of you would like to go ahead? I can take this one. Um, so we're currently working on a hydrogeologic evaluation at the transfer station site. Um, the purpose of the evaluation is to characterize the site for potential treated effluent recharge. And the project consists of two main components. Um, the first is a series of field investigations to characterize um, what the potential hydraulic loading rate of the site is. And that's done through a, um, the installation of a monitoring well so that we can monitor groundwater during our testing to evaluate for potential localized groundwater mounding, a percolation test, a soil profile done through a um, test pit and a three-day hydraulic load test. That's a series of constant and falling head tests. And we did put together a draft work plan um, that's been submitted to MassDEP and we'll continue to coordinate with Michelle and Bruce for the, the scheduling of the testing, which is anticipated within the next two months, October, November. And then the data that's collected from the testing will be used in a groundwater model to characterize the potential for groundwater mounding and for particle tracking analysis to track where the nitrogen from the potential site um, would ultimately recharge to the ecosystem. So that's just a very brief overview of the project. Um, and I wanted to see if anyone had any questions on our approach. Keep marching forward then. So Millie, I see you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you for that. Can you tell me out of all the scenarios that um, you've identified today, the nine of them, um, which one has a more di direct nexus with um, this load test planning? Is it the uh, hospital one, excuse me, the housing one, or like how is your effort going to tie in and help us um, decide, you know, contribute towards the selection of the correct um, technologies? Scott, did you want to address that? Sure, I'll, 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 I'll take a first cut at it. Um, so I guess the nine technologies that I indicated, Millie, were in addition to the uh, centralized sewer option. Um, and ultimately, it's likely we'll end up with some sort of a hybrid um, of those two uh, um, until we get the results of GHD's analysis of the transfer site. We don't know what the capacity of that site is. Uh, and I also think that at some point, the town's going to look at comparative cost estimates between that solution and uh, the enhanced INA. So I think Brian's comments earlier about a phased approach are gonna make a lot of sense here because um, I think I don't think anybody really knows on the cost basis at this point um, what the comparison ultimately will look like for Wellfleet. There's numbers from other towns we can use and are using to try to compare that. And it certainly looks like the INA is worth considering on the cost basis. But as Brian indicated, we're gonna get that approved out so um, I, w I guess my, my response to your question would be that uh, we would include, once we get the results of GHD's analysis, that as part of the plan, but design it in one of the phases, and I'm not sure which one yet. Um, 
I recommend looking at the Pleasant Bay permit. Uh, these are generally done in five year increments. Uh, so we might look at say further design of the centralized solution during that first phase while we're also maybe trying out some of these other solutions and then make a decision and commitment one way or the other at the end of that first phase. At least that's one way I'm thinking about it how, as how they might fit together. Right. So this is a feeder document to the backup plan. That's right. I think that's right. Yeah. Thank you. A thing to keep in mind too is that uh, although we'll be uh, providing an estimate of what the hydraulic capacity is at the site, then I presume Scott and others will be looking at what the you know, nitrogen capacity is at that location if it has an impact on other watersheds so that um, it may be able to take more water physically, but it, you either may have to balance that with other uh, treatment or removals, or you may downsize what you want to actually recharge there so you can stay under some kind of cap or threshold. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Recognize this, the transfer station is in the Herring River watershed where the town is spending an enormous amount of time and ultimately probably money to restore that watershed uh, in part to hope to get some nitrogen mitigation. So if we, whatever, if there is a system that's get built and treated and disposed in that watershed, it will be a net addition and increase of nitrogen to that. So as Jeff's indicating, there would have to be some compensation and mitigation for that as part of the plan. But that's something we'll look at in the uh, targeted plan, some alternatives. Keeping in mind too, there's a, the, you know, the, the Herring River restoration project is one mitigation and the other is uh, all the homes in that watershed already that are currently not sewered. So, you, you know, you do have some, you know, mitigation there as well. I should mention, Tim, Tim, you've done some preliminary work on this, looking at potential flows and treatment based upon addition to that watershed. I don't know, we, we don't need to go that through that now, but um, Com Cape Cod Commission has been providing some really good support on some of these uh, issues. So we can integrate that analysis as it's updated from the GHD analysis into our plan. Um, I'm just looking at our agenda and it seems like we are talking about Herring River. Do we want to go out of order and segue directly to the Herring River? Um, and then we can jump back to the things that we're leaving behind because I think that's an important topic that we certainly want to cover today considering we are doing work looking at citing a sewer there potentially. So um, I don't know if Brian or Patty, you want to take this one? Um, well, Patty, Patty and Barb have more direct, um, more direct involvement than I do, so I would defer to them. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I thought the agenda was EPA was going to talk about what they're doing at the Herring River. Um, I can tell you what we're, my understanding of the Herring River with respect to the TMDL is, um, to put it in perspective, but um, I don't have information on on uh, the schedule or how the restoration project is going. Um, we would like to see some nitrogen monitoring um, added to the restoration project uh, so that we could see how um, the restoration project helps the main harbor. Um, we definitely feel like the uh, increased flushing, tidal flushing, is going to reduce the nitrogen load that gets into the Wellfleet Harbor. Um, there was an oversight, uh, whatever mistake, in the, in the um, MEP uh, tech report in that they missed that there was some eelgrass, uh, very small, but there were some patches of eelgrass in the mouth of the Herring River um, in 1995 and 2001. So we definitely want restoration of some eelgrass in that area. Um, so I have more questions about what's, um, how we can work with the restoration project to get some monitoring. Um, it wasn't specifically modeled, um, but we know, you know, it just seems logical that we're gonna see some eventually, maybe initially there'd be a higher nitrogen load as there's flushing behind the dike, et cetera. But we should see some improvement in that area. Um, and it may involve, and likely involves additional modeling um, to specifically look at that. Hmm. 
what type what type of modeling who who would undertake that well uh the modeling that mep that smas did um we you know that would be ideally to continue what they what they started but it would involve a great deal of my, i think it would involve a lot of work because they didn't look um because of just adding a, a additional data they looked at the herring river as a salt marsh a static salt marsh because that's how it's acting currently without the restoration project um so so that would be one direction but the department would like to do a second phase of um we're going to call it like nitrogen reduction load, um, in estuaries i think we're going to change the name from mep but um we're going to be looking at additional estuaries that weren't done in their phase one um, so that's we could possibly roll it into that phase two but uh, i haven't gotten that far to figure out who would do the modeling and um you know hopefully i was kind of hoping it might be done through the restoration project so you're looking at nitrogen modeling then specifically for a restored Herring River, not what's existing. Um, so I'm not sure what the question is. I'm, I'm just saying to be able to predict that the changes that they propose for the restoration project, removal of dikes, um, that to be able to really predict the impact to the mouth and to the the rest of the Wellfleet Harbor, I think we'd need to look at additional modeling scenarios to really be able to predict that. We we haven't specifically looked at that. Because I, I think there are a couple things, Hillary, is that you know when they did when they set up the hydrodynamic grid on you know the the existing you know, under the existing tech report, they really only went up as far as the dike. It looks like, um, so you know. Obviously, that's a limiting factor, even you know, projecting out into the future. Um, but it represented existing conditions. Um, so, if part of the restoration is to remove the dike, and let's say for the sake of argument that the dike is actually going to get removed then that is a physical change to the system itself. And so it would have to kind of be remodeled because now you don't have that artificial boundary. The influence is gonna go farther up the river and therefore I think the hydrodynamic model would have to extend farther up. Um, so, you know, that would be, you know, that would be one thing um, that you know, depending upon the certainty of removing the dike, that would either be, you know, an alternate scenario, or it would just be a remodeling of the system similar to the way we're remodeling Pleasant Bay, because the original model was done with only one um, inlet down at the southern end near Chatham, um, whereas now there are two inlets, the southern one and the, and the more northerly one uh, from the break in was it 2007? Um, so um, I think that's kind of you know that that's kind of what we're what we're thinking about. Yeah, I'll just offer Barbara. When you were talking, I think I heard you say both modeling and monitoring. And yeah. um, I've talked to I, I'm uh, I've talked to John Portnoy about this project, who's I think as most people know is the local resident expert on the Herring River. Um, and, uh, and I think it's fair to say that the likely nitrogen benefit outcomes from that project are going to be really hard to predict. Um, and I'm wondering if monitoring, baseline monitoring, coupled with, again, a phased post-construction monitoring plan to evaluate the benefits might be as valuable perhaps more valuable than a modeling effort. Uh, I think my, my, my sense is that this might be one of those projects that um, we might set ourselves up for some expectations that aren't really based. If you were to run the uh, statistics on the confidence limits on those models, you may not be getting nearly as definitive of an answer as you might think you might be getting. So that's 
my thoughts on on that. I did have one other question, Barbara, to it related to the the eelgrass because that's a it's a tidal area right now. Um, do you have data on on that eelgrass? And you know, the other two thoughts that occurred to me when you know I saw that that item come by is uh, I think if there was eelgrass. Part of the problem in Wellfleet Harbor in general, which is, you know, something that we are trying to address, is that, you know, between dragging and um, human, um, you know, walking on these, on the, on the flats and so on, there are a variety of, in, you know, a variety of uh, impacts on eelgrass that prevent it from growing back, you know, so certainly if, and also the, with sea level rise and tidal changes, we're getting much bigger tidal ranges. So the extent of eelgrass um, may be changing as well. So, you know, I, I'm not sure how we'd, you know, how we'd look at restoring eelgrass in the mouth. Um, it is tidal, so I'm surprised that there, you know, that there may be some data showing that. Typically, eelgrass is subtidal. Uh, so, anyway, be interested to see that, and and obviously want to talk further about how we can. We obviously want to we we want to restore eelgrass, and and obviously that's part of the, the overall effort here. So, um, just like to hear more. Uh, yeah, the there's uh, in our record our eelgrass mapping on Oliver. Um, we show some small amount of eelgrass um, in 1995 and 2001, and then prior to 1995, we only have the aerial photographic record from 1951, um, which we don't heavily rely on, and it is there was no record uh, report of it at that time, um, but it was, it is fairly small, even on, it shown in Oliver for 95. Um, so I don't know, you know, what happened prior to that. Um, but we did talk about that internally about what other causes could be um, contributing to the eelgrass loss. It may not just be nitrogen loading. Um, it's very true. But it's dragged and dredged and walked and <laughs> yeah. at that particular area. Um, yeah. It's, it's tough. We, you know, I, I'd like to see that we, you know, in the, in the best of all possible worlds, I'd like to see more areas of the Harbor uh, restricted from dragging to help eelgrass recovery, but that's just, you know, obviously there's, there's politics involved there too. I'll send you the link um, and maybe we can talk about, where you, if you think this area um, that there is walking and dredging and raking and, um, you know, you can see if you think it seems realistic that there was eelgrass there, but it was recorded in two different um, DEPs, you know, eelgrass mapping projects. So that means they go out and they actually field certify the location when they, when they record it. They take okay. aerial photographs. Right. No, I'd love to, love to see that. That'd be great. Okay. And, and it's and given you know the way the the mapping program works i mean it's act, you actually physically go out there in a boat and take pictures and videos it's unlikely that it would be in you know an exposed tidal area so i mean there might be dragging um but i don't think there's any impact from or <coughs> impact from walking yeah it's a little further south i think than you might be thinking yeah, that might make sense in, in the outer the part gut. of the bay. Yeah, I think it's more in the gut than it is at the at the mouth. Yeah, yes. that would make more sense. I'm trying to that would, the name. That would make more sense. Yeah. Can I just go back? I'm still trying to wrap my mind around the um, flushing of the system when it's restored. So, is the concern from DEP that we're going to get initial pulses of nitrogen as we begin to restore the Herring River? Um, no, not from my perspective. I just threw that out there as that is um, a possibility. But as even Scott said, he doesn't really know that that we're going to see nitrogen reduction overall. Um, you know, um, it seems logical that we would if we're doing all that work um, in the upland and um, you get increased tidal flushing. And, you know, that's one of the ways that we and other estuaries on the Cape have uh, met our um, nitrogen loading is to in enhance tidal flushing, particularly on Martha's Vineyard. Right. Um, so, so I, 
but nowhere in any of the documents. So I'm I'm putting that out there as a possibility of, of you know what would help, but nothing in the restoration documents have looked at nitrogen, have um, speculated that it would be there'd be a reduction or what would okay. happen to it. I guess I, I'm just asking because I want to be able to reach out to the seashore and ask them the right question because they are the you know keepers and holders of all this modeling and they have tons of research and I can't imagine that somewhere along the line they haven't looked at this. Maybe it's not in these reports, but um, I feel like there must be information on this somewhere in their research. So it, I, I guess I want to ask them the right question. So if you could help me frame that of what you're looking for, I can work with them to find the information that you need. So I don't know if Barbara, you can get that to me or Brian or Patty or whomever, but just frame up the question for me so I can ask it properly to them. Yeah, I, I can do that. I can send you an email. I did send a couple emails to Tim Smith. At, okay, uh, perfect. Park Service. Okay. Yeah. And he got back to me and said they aren't doing any nitrogen monitoring that he's aware of. Okay. So. Okay. I will Barbara. forward you that email that I that Great. I got from him. Perfect. Bar Barbara, Thanks. just if I may, Barbara, just to clarify what I was saying earlier, I didn't I, I didn't mean to insinuate that I, I didn't think the project would help reduce nitrogen loading, because I think it will. That's my 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 um, belief. Okay. What I was trying to make a point is I think it's difficult to model accurately, meaning predict the actual level of reduction because of how complex the system is. That was my point. Not, not, that, not that it wouldn't help. I think, I believe it will help. I'm just not sure how much. We've been looking at the same issue in, in Mayo Creek. And, and again, it's really hard to predict, I think, the actual levels, but I do believe that both projects will, will help. Yeah, the, the literature that I've looked at, the range is um, like 10 orders of magnitude. It's, you know, from one, si from one system to another. They're positive, but it can be a little or it can be a lot. <laughs> so somehow this appeared on the EPA, under the EPA uh, topic list. And I'm wondering if EPA has an opinion or, you know, also Patty and encourage her to weigh in on this. Well, Mike really wanted to hear what EPA had to say because we did have some questions when we did a draft TMDL and then they came back and said it was said that um, we need to be lowering the threshold to meet eelgrass restoration and um, the study had not uh, and, and they wanted to do an um, alternate TMDL for the Herring River and which didn't really do monitoring on nitrogen. So I just had a lot of questions for EPA um, with regards to where they wanted us to go. So I really don't have any. I just have questions. I don't have any answers. Well, I don't want to put Brian on the spot because it was someone else at EPA that I spoke to about um, who's more. Brian used to be in the TMD group. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bob, Bob and I used to work together on the TMDLs. Um, and, and you're right, Bob. I've been out of that group now. Of years. Um, I have not had my hands on the Herring River um, in the last couple of years. I've really been focused on the tool away program itself. Um, I'd be happy to circle back with that with that unit um, and pull some folks in if you if you'd like to have a further discussion about the Herring River, um, kind of where that group is looking to go um, and what their opinion is. Unfortunately, I you know with uh, especially with all of us being out of the office for the past, what, uh, seven months now. Um, those, those wires are hard to, to cross um, you know, if we're not all there. So uh, I apologize for that, um, but happy to, happy to circle back and, and get back to this group. Um, if there's anything you know, specific or just if you're looking for a general response from the TMDL group on, on uh, this restoration effort and what they can provide and the sort of insight that they'd like to share. Um, I'd be happy to do that. I mean, is it plausible that, I mean, I've heard someone say that it's a very small area and of course we love all our natural resources and part of the restoration plan is to ensure that all the resources are restored. But, um, you know, the question for me is, is this a showstopper with regards to moving forward with any progress as part of the restoration? 
I don't think it should be. Um, because again, um, I think, you know, Scott's point about monitoring um, the effectiveness of any activities is, is going to help guide us. And it, it basically boils down to adaptive management. And this is something I think that we can defer to, um, yeah. you know, to later phases. Right. Um, because there's no question that we have to do something to address issues in the main body of the harbor. Mm -hmm. So we can focus on, on those activities and then make whatever adjustments and corrections we have to make as, as we get more data. Right, so the watershed permit could acknowledge it and um, incorporate it in the correct phase. Yep. And again, you know, it's premised on adaptive management. Yeah. And, I'll, and I'll, just, I'll just add briefly, when I reviewed the EIR of the Herring River Project a few years ago as part of 208, I was very surprised that there was no baseline nitrogen monitoring or consideration of nitrogen in that project at that point. And I might add from my reading of many restoration projects throughout the Commonwealth, this is something that has not been commonly part of them. And I've been, a, I and other people have been advocates of adding that analysis. And I think we're starting to get it. So I think Herring River might be a good opportunity to do exactly what you're suggesting, Millie, and uh, get some baseline monitoring going now and uh, make it part of our targeted plan. Because clearly the town wants to move ahead with the project, pr primarily for habitat restoration reasons. But I think we will get some measurable nitrogen benefits. We'll only know that if we can measure it. And, and if the yield grass is where, is on the outer part of the um, outlet, where I think it, where I think it might have been, Barbara, um, you know, I, I've always felt that we should be talking about having a no drag line it would encompass that to allow it to come back. So, you know, as part of, again, as part of the restoration, that would, that would be logical. And I, I don't think, you know, the amount of resource being taken there from draggers is relatively small um, compared to the benefits that would come from biodiversity and, um, and even um, scallop uh, reproduction and other species that depend on eelgrass. So, you know, I think there's room, it would be great to be able to do something like that. Mm -hmm. Anything else on Herring River? Do we want to move to another? Yes, as I say, do we want to circle back and hear from the Cape Cod Commission? It looked like Erin had joined us for a little bit. I don't know if she's gone again. Um, and we have Tim here. I don't know if they have any more of an update to provide. Uh, I I don't have anything on top of the the kind of cost stuff that I presented earlier. You know, other than simply that we're, we're continuing to work pretty closely with Scott through the development of this, but that was all I had specific to, uh, to Wellfleet for right now. Great. And um, then I think we can turn to DEP to provide an update on the nitrogen sensitive areas that you're planning or working through some regulation, because we would love to hear more about that. Well, you know, as, as Scott said, um, there was a stakeholder meeting that was convened oh, two or three weeks ago um, to talk about changes to those specific regulations in Title V. Currently, we designate um, by, um, by category for nitrogen sensitive areas, um, uh, interim wellhead protection areas, and zone twos for public drinking water supply wells. And that assigns uh, a limit of 440 gallons per day per acre, primarily for protection of drinking water supplies. It's not uh, a limit that is necessarily adequately protective of nitrogen impaired embayments. There is a further provision in the current regulations that allows us to designate nitrogen sensitive embayments. However, that requires a regulatory change for each individual embayment 
both in Title V and in the Surface Water Quality Standards, which as you can imagine is a rather cumbersome process. So uh, we were soliciting suggestions um, on how to address that. And among some of the suggestions that we heard were that um, any embayment that has a TMDL should be uh, automatically designated as nitrogen sensitive. Um, it was suggested that embayments on the integrated list formerly known as the 303D list should be uh, incorporated uh, as a category um, and then still leaving the option open for um, for naming individual embayments as, as necessary, sort of as a, you know, an elastic clause. Um, and then whether or not there should be specific exemptions for any limitations, such as if you have a CWMP or a, or a targeted watershed management plan or under a watershed permit. Um, again, these were suggestions that came out. Is that, did I cover them, Scott? I think that's it. Yeah. So, um, so what we're in the process internally now of doing is, you know, regrouping and coming and, and trying to draft uh, regulations that, um, you know, we think will ap appropriately address the comments that we've received. And then uh, once we've done that, we will um, distribute that to the stakeholder group, reconvene the stakeholder group and, and try to come to a consensus um, and then move forward with the regulatory process, hopefully being able to get something done uh, sometime next year. Yeah, that is correct. I mean, it would go through the normal public hearing process, um, but I think there is a lot of appetite to get this done. Just so we can further the 208 um, just mission and goals here. Do you see any? Do you see any impacts on us specifically um, with regard to what we've presented today? On the regulations themselves? Yeah. If you you know, assuming it goes forward, um, do you see anything that we need to modify or change, or or is it just consistent and supportive? I I I don't I don't think that you would have to modify anything. Um, the the only you know the only impact I think that it would have would that it would put you you know it would put you under um, you know the designate potentially put you under a designation of a nitrogen sensitive embayment um, and you know that may impact how you know you formulate your local bylaw um, for enhanced nitrogen removal systems. But again, if you have a watershed permit, um, based on some of the suggestions that we had, if we were to incorporate that in the regulations, that also may offer an exemption from um, having to immediately uh, meet those requirements because ostensibly the watershed permit would, would put you under an enforceable schedule and obligation to address nitrogen in a more comprehensive fashion than just relying on Title V. Right, again, the watershed pre permit premise is that it provides you with um, enough time to, to avail yourselves to a wide variety of scenarios and um, strategies to get to the finish line. And I think also the most powerful thing is that you have that enforcement forbearance. So I think that's why we have really talked about um, you know, currently you are the only community on the Cape right now that's um, after PBA is really pursuing this watershed permit and um, we're devoting staff and, and senior leadership attention to making sure that, you know, you have a plan that, that looks um, like it's technologically and um, regulatorily feasible and we really want to put a lot of stock in your work. So, um, you know, you have us now and we're more than happy to carry on this journey. Um, and I think um, 
it would be really great if we could start thinking about how is this really going to flesh out and what is the permit going to look like. Um, you know, we've given you some examples, well, the one example, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, if you desire to start thinking about um, accelerating a little bit the drafting of the permit, just, just let us know. Sure. Um, and clearly, you know, it's all about money also for you to make sure that you don't commit yourself to something that you don't have the money to do um, the work that you are setting out to do. So we are, you know, we will actively pursue any avenue that we can um, pursue um, between the federal and state government and, and other, and, you know, other, other uh, flows of cash need be to get you through this. Terrific. Well, I, I really appreciate that. I mean, the other thing that I'm really excited about is I think one of the elements of our plan that might get missed a little bit because we're, we are a little bit smaller and, uh, less population dense, um, you know, we've got a lot of our nitrogen is natural in origin. So we've got to be working about working on both our uh, in estuary um, restoration. So whether it's eelgrass, whether it's Saharan River, Mayo Creek, you know, the oyster stuff, that's really, really important. But we've also got a plan, I think with the PRB options and some others, you know, looking at interception uh, to help the estuary, but then also source reduction with regard to the 95 Lawrence, the enhanced IAs, and our backup, um, you know, sewering plan for the town. So we, I think we're, I'm hopeful that you're seeing that we're covering all the bases here in a way that should make you feel really good about our plan. And so, I mean, we're obviously here to try to get your reaction and feedback. And, um, but from my perspective, I, I feel like we're, we're covering a lot of the bases. So, you know, and hopefully, you know, my question is, are you seeing the same thing? <laughs> I'm actually pleasantly surprised, you know, really happy to see the wide variety of things. And I think you really have done a great job of trying to, you know, um, avail yourself to every single potential um, solution that there's to be had. I think having the adaptive management approach is really going to help. And again, to um, solidify our position that we hope that all these alternative, um, non-traditional alternatives do work. And, you know, just being able to avail yourself to a traditional backup plan, I think that needs to be memorialized and you're doing everything you can to incorporate that as a backup plan. Terrific. Great. Well, thank you. Thank Great you. Job. Hey, so Brian Doerr, I don't know if you have anything else you'd like to add from the EPA perspective, but you're new, you're new to our group, so we'll hand the floor over to you. Uh, much appreciated. Um, hey, you know, thanks for, first of all, just thanks for having, uh, giving me the opportunity to, to join in today. Um, you know, EPA has had a lot of discussions. We try to have regular discussions with DEP about things that are going on in the Cape and in all of our partners and what people are doing and where it's happening. Um, and so we've heard a lot of, you know, secondhand information about what's going on in Wellfleet or some of the other communities. Um, so it's nice to be able to actually be at the table here today and hear the discussion um, and see some of the presentations that just, you know, bring us up a little bit more up to speed um, and help us engage a little bit more directly. Um, you know, I think most of our efforts over the past year have really been focused um, in some of the efforts that Scott has talked about over in the Upper Cape communities over in Three Bays. Um, we've spent a lot of time working on some of those pilot projects that have been, um, you know, kind of thrown around today about the, the woodchip bioreactor um, and some of those IA systems. Um, EPA, um, Marcel and I last summer worked on using drones to actually try and find where some of these water, um, some of the groundwater inputs might, might be occurring and, and trying to find some different methods that um, could be either low cost or low effort to try and help towns identify where these, where the nitrogen sinks might be um, coming from. And so a lot of our work over the last year has been looking at those pilot, pilot efforts and trying to provide that technical um, assistance wherever we can. Um, so, you know, I, I know that um, we were talking about PRBs earlier here and where they might fit in in Wellfleet. Um, and so, I, I don't want to throw Marcel's time out on this table, you know, for him. But, um, you know, having worked with Marcel on some of the, the prior PRB efforts on the Cape, um, you know, that first go around, I think it was about four or five years ago now when EPA first engaged on that. 
um, I know that we would be interested in, in helping in, in especially in, in those types of efforts wherever that we can. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of our funding for KPORT comes through SNAP. Um, I think, as most of you are probably aware, that their geographic area um, ends, I believe, before Wellfleet. So that has been kind of a, a space that we're, we're trying to bridge um, and figure out how we can get some more of our funding and, and be able to, to provide that um, out to those communities. Um, and so that's something that, um, you know, I've also been looking at internally and hopefully can have some good news in the next, you know, in, the, in our future discussions, um, whether it's an actual financial commitment or something that we can provide, you know, technical assistance that would be um, helpful to those efforts. Um, it's certainly something that we would like to do um, and, are, and are trying to find a way to do. Um, so that's just kind of a, a, you know, a background on what we've been involved in. Um, you know, in the future, if I'd, I'd be happy to, to continue coming to these and bringing, you know, the, the pertinent people to the table um, from the region um, that, that might be able to speak a little bit more specifically to things like the Herring River or um, if Marcel and I can engage on the TWMP um, effort, again, like we did with the Pleasant Bay um, watershed permit, that would be wonderful and something that we'd like to do as well. Um, so however we can help, I'm happy to do so, you know, as, as much to our ability as I can. Um, and, and looking forward to working with all of you. Um, and, and really, you know, to echo Millie, pleasantly surprised to see um, the depth of this this work and, and the, the thoughts that you really do and put into this. So much appreciated and uh, looking forward to being involved. Great. Thank hey, you. Brian, can I just quickly thank you for being here today and, and respond to your, what I heard is a potential offer for some of Marcel's time. I say, <laughs> I say that partly jokingly, but partly serious. I've really enjoyed working with him on the Barnstable project you mentioned. And uh, we are at a really good point here in Wellfleet to start um, conceptually designing this thing. So um, I've been thinking about calling Marcel, but I didn't want to infringe on his time since he's been helping us so much in Barnstable. But uh, if you could help me open that door, I would love to uh, at least have that conversation. I'd, I'd be happy to, Scott. Um, I, I can share, I, I mean, this isn't, it's not going to be ever publicly announced or anything, but the region is going to place, you know, the Cape back on one of its higher levels of focus um, for the next couple of years here. Yeah. Uh, we're ramping that back up internally right now. Um, right. Not that it hasn't been a focus, but to really yeah. be one of the top regional focuses. Um, and so I think Marcel and I will have you know, much more time to be involved in, in the support from our, our directors to do that. So I would very much look forward to, that, to, to doing that. And um, I don't want to speak for him either, but I, I think he would personally be excited to do that as well. Thanks. We'll be in touch. Absolutely. Thank you, Ryan. Hillary, do we still have Route 6 on the agenda? Yep, that was the last thing I was just going <laughs> to move us to, is um, the Route 6 and Main Street in Wellfleet reconstruction project. Um, this is right when you turn left at the traffic lights heading into town. It's slated for reconstruction with Mass DOT and the town of Wellfleet. And in reviewing um, the proposed plans for that location, we recognize that we need some serious stormwater controls in the area and that we also have a culvert that runs under Main Street and runs into Howes Pond, which is a very small pond um, in Wellfleet uh, right next to Route 6. When they received a call, I guess this is Mass DOT, received a call several years back um, that a property was flooding Mass DOT and Mass DEP worked together to replace the culvert there, essentially cutting off all saltwater flow and tidal flushing to House Pond. So this has been um, several years in the making a, a, a problem for the town of Wellfleet. The Conservation Commission has corresponded with Mass DEP and Mass DOT trying to get a remedy. Uh, most recently, Mass DOT undertook a hydrologic study of the area to which we're still waiting to see the report um, to see if we can get some more tidal flushing there. So I think our hope here is that 
you folks may be able to help us um, have a closer look at that area and restore some tidal flow because we know that's useful and beneficial not only to the environment but to the nutrients that are accumulating in the pond um, and help us move that project forward as well. And, and I'll just add this project, if you're not familiar with it, is also at the headwaters of Duck Creek, critical area. And uh, since we did the 208 plan, the public meetings in Wellfleet, I remember people talking about stormwater from Route 6, trying to remediate. So now we have a project where the state's going to spend a lot of money working on a road and using the complete streets approach while we got it all dug up. It'd be really nice to add some nitrogen mitigation there. So we're looking for some help on making that happen and also some technical assistance on the best way to do it. We've requested in writing some dialogue along those lines, but we're in, I guess we're waiting at this point, right, Hillary, to hear back from DOT. Exactly. Is that region five out of Taunton? Yes. I mean, I can call the director and see if we can set up a call. I mean, she's wonderful. fairly yeah. responsive when we've had some issues with some similar projects. Um, yeah. We'll take any help we can get. I think there's going to be probably a swift letter writing campaign from the town <laughs> pretty soon on the situation. So I think the sooner we can sort of get it moving in the right direction, the better we'll all be. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can give her a call. Um, I just probably honestly, so I've been um, out of DP for like two months and a half. I just, um, it's a long story. Don't clean. I <laughs> messed up my leg. Um, but the point is uh, more than happy to pick up the ball. I just need a little bit of coaching. And if you do have any kind of correspondence, uh, just shoot me whatever's um, the back and forth and I can definitely coordinate with Brian and um, some other folks. I can definitely also work with Gary Moran from our commissioner's office. Kind of really? I have some emails I can forward to you. Yeah, if you just give me the right yep. post and then um, I just need to do a bit of homework and re-engage so that. That's perfect. And I can send you the history as well because it's, um, I have a whole folder on it. So I'll send you what I have. Okay, be my pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Is, is any of the work that's proposed to be done um, going to include any sort of resurfacing that would um, have the five-year moratorium on curb cuts? That's a good question, Brian. I don't know offhand. Because we may want to look into that because, you know, depending upon what your schedule would be for any collection system downtown, whether or not you might want to consider coordinating laying some dry sewer. Mm. Yes. I think, wasn't that the issue in Yarmouth? Um, Orleans. I don't, it was, it certainly was in Orleans. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So I think we need to understand the schedule so that if they are doing some um, curve cuts, um, you know, any kind of work can take place because otherwise you're stuck with that five-year moratorium deal. Good point. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it'd be a big deal there as an intersection reconstruction. So there's not really a lot of, if we put something in the ground, you know, I'm not sure what, you know, what the real benefit would be longer term, especially if we do the 95 Lawrence. 95 Lawrence is, is almost contiguous to that area, but it would probably connect a different way, that whole, that whole area of town. So the only thing that's coming down Route 6 would be, there's some businesses south. Um, there's just not a lot of density in that area. I think the project does come down Commercial Street somewhat, but not too, too far. Yeah, it's basically just the intersection, so. Mm -hmm. Which is, just happens to be where this culvert is. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, sounds like um, we need to get on in front of this very quickly. I ask another question, this may not be the appropriate venue, but it just came to mind. Any large pots of money to purchase property, because that whole property uh, is for sale, um, or a strategy to kind of look at that. Um, Which property? It's, it's, um, the Wagner and the Tavern. Um, oh yeah, right, right, right. And we know that that building has flooded with some large storms. So I don't know. 
Like the types of things that, for example, Orenda land trusts, they do, they kind of purchase property like, um, you know, EEA may actually have, the Secretariat may have a robust sort of land acquisition program. Yeah, um, just a thought. It, it just, it just it didn't mind that if that's for sale, maybe the town should look at that. I don't, I mean, it's sort of pie in the sky, but. So basically an area where you can have some, some loading, is that what you're looking at? I'm not thinking for loading. I'm thinking we could have more of a restoration project to house pond and allow greater tidal flow to that pond. Mm-hmm. I mean, CPA money has been used yeah. for that. Um, there's a possibility that you might be able to get um, you might be able to get some SRF money. Um, they have in the past considered funding land acquisition, if it particularly if it can be related to nitrogen mitigation. Hmm. Um, yeah, so. Sorry, it just came to mind. I, I just yeah, so you know what along those lines it begs the question as to whether that should be even considered as a potential strategy and you know turning the nine into a ten. Yeah. It may be out of range for us. I just I don't know. Just it just popped into my mind at that moment. So I had to spit it out there just to get it out there. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Well, and it's um, also, it's a highly productive um, uh, eel, isn't it? A highly productive eel yeah. ground? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and turtles, and I mean, it's a, it's an important, it is, believe, it's just crazy, but it is a pretty important habitat. Mm -hmm. So is the property for sale, or is this something that yeah, you would... It actually, it actually is for sale. Um, it's on the market right now, so my guess is we can't get our wheels turning that fast, but maybe Kurt and Scott, we can have that discussion offline from these guys. Mm -hmm. Well, let us, um, maybe we can take that as an action item to see um, if there are any active programs, you know, um, grant programs or any kind of program that doles out money for the purposes of, you know, to await or you know, just, just a nexus back to what we're trying to do here. That's great. Perfect. It'd be like a $2 million acquisition for habitat restoration. <laughs> Is it $2 million just for the tavern piece? I, I have no idea. I, I could ask. Yeah, just round numbers, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> just a thought. Just a thought. We'll, we'll <laughs> leave it there. <laughs> Good to know. Okay. And with that, it's 2.52. I think we've covered everything on the agenda. So if there are any closing remarks, statements, anyone has anything else to say? A question and a remark. So my question is, um, basically, is there anything that we've talked about that might be up for discussion during any kind of um, upcoming public meetings or there's nothing for town vote, right? In November, there's nothing like that in front of us here. What my goal is, is to try to get our, our watershed permit uh, formulated in, you know, at enough of a level of detail that we could consider a warrant item either this coming spring mm -hmm. um, or the fall. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this active engagement, on the part of the uh, Board of Selectmen. Um, you know, they're looking for a recommendation from us on the 95 Lawrence Road to, you know, to include residential as well as the municipal component. Uh, so there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of momentum that I think we, we need to jump on. And I think there's a lot of support in town. So, you know, ideally, you know, in the back of my mind, we're looking at, you know, I don't know exactly what the numbers are, but something between maybe six and $12 million for you know, a comprehensive uh, wastewater plan that would be um, built around the watershed permit and mm -hmm. probably include um, the water system, you know, in terms of staffing uh, to support implementation, monitoring, et cetera. So that's kind of, that's kind of where the, the thinking is. And, you know, so we're, we're as anxious to move on this, I think, as you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I guess my, my remark would be that twofold. The first is, at least I came out with a few action items um, to go back to the team and discuss um, 
with regards to whether it's the PRB and funding or, you know, uh, again, that was an idea that came to us um, from, you know, Gov's office asking, you know, what about um, if there's a candidate site out there? And, and again, I'm, I, I need to go back to my emails. It's been a long time. But I mean, if there's something that we can um, assist with to ju basically just move us in the right direction, um, for sure, the one thing we can do is um, assist you with having the monthly or maybe every other month meetings as we did with PBA um, to start drafting the pieces of what this watershed permit will look like. So we can then uh, start getting folks in Boston uh, moving and legal review. That took a little bit, um, but you know, now that we've done it and um, it's working very well for PBA community, um, we can definitely just, you know, we have that footprint. So we can definitely start moving it working also clearly with um, conservation, um, with uh, Cape Cod Commission, which were instrumental. So, um, you know, easier said than done, but we really need to start, if we're really serious, let's really jumpstart this process of the writing and getting everything in order. And um, I think working with EPA to see even if they can assist with technical assistance on PRBs or any other thing, if they don't have the ability to assist with financial because SNAP is the only avenue and it kind of stops right at the upper cape. Um, but you know, well, fleet is very important. We need to get this done. And I think we have a really good opportunity here. Great, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank so you. I'd say we have some work to do on our end to begin drafting. And um, once we get some more things together, we'll reach out and call another meeting. Fair. Great. And we'll send you what we said we'd send you and we'll wait to hear back from you guys on whatever you're gonna get back to us on. So <laughs> we can exchange information in the meantime. Got it. Right. Thank you all so much for coming and participating. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, Hillary. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Have a good one.